specifics of what they did, but yeah. Wasn't that the uh, mission moment? That was the, the actual parade that they went to, but she's saying, did somebody go to the campus, like outside of the actual um, parade that went on? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Let's see if I can. Oh, so they were they were meeting there and then going from there to the parade. So they weren't actually doing ministry on campus. It was just the central meeting point. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So all I know is that they met there. So anybody else? Man, we'll take it. All right, if you got your uh, sheet, just going to do a brief review. We're, I wasn't planning on doing it a two-part series, but we had such good interaction last week um, just talking about stewardship of time, and uh, I wanted to make sure that we could get through all of this. So really, it's looking at stewardship of time, generally speaking, but also like technology and relationships, and uh, I, I believe all three of those go together really well. Uh, as we go through here, hopefully you'll see that, but you know, the, the more technology that we're getting, the more time we're spending on technology, and the less time we're actually spending with real people. And uh, the, the studies, because it's been going on for you know a long time now, um, you can go online and read these studies, and it's just detrimental effects. Nothing positive is coming out of this, whether it be psychologically, physically, emotionally, um, just the amount of time people spend away from real relationships, like actually sitting down and speaking with somebody. I'm not talking about even like a Zoom call because that's not a, a real relationship either. That's just you talking to a head. Um, and it's a, a finite amount of time and uh, you don't get anything because, you know, most communication is done through nonverbal uh, body language and all of those kind of things. So when you don't have that, you're not, you're not really fully communicating with somebody. Uh, and so when you're just having like a Zoom call or a telephone call, those things certainly have their, their places. Um, but that, that's not a substitute for a real relationship. Just imagine as a married man, if you only communicated with your wife on FaceTime or on Zoom, and that was it. You never talked to her otherwise. Like, you wouldn't say, yeah, we have a great relationship, <laughs> right? Uh, at least I hope you wouldn't. We'll just say you wouldn't. You can agree with me. Um, and so that's what I wanted to look at as we, as we continue on. But because we're living in the, the technological age where, you know, we're all somehow doing something with technology whether we want to or not uh, and it is all around us uh, and then what does it look like with time uh, and then what does it look like you know regarding relationships so we stopped on page four but if you go to just page three just to give you a brief kind of overview of the that first half of the page on page three time management relationships and technology uh, we talked a little bit about you know there are people who are, you know, um, technological natives. That's all they've ever known. You know, my, my kids, um, all they know is that they've grown up with, you know, they're both born overseas. And so every time you wanted to talk to grandma or grandpa, you always did it where you could see them. Skype, Zoom, I don't think Zoom was around back then. Barely had Skype. And, uh, and so all, that's all they would know is, and so when we came back to the States and they would pick up a telephone, they wouldn't know even what a telephone was, um, or like you'd hear a dial tone, they would say something's, what's going on, like it's making a noise, right? And so you forget those kind of things. Um, and so you have those people who grew up in it, and then you have um, people like myself who didn't grow up with it, but you're submersed into it, so we, they call those, you're an immigrant into the technology age. So you have, uh, whether by choice or force, been immigrated into the, the technological age, whether you like it or not. Um, and so our time, our technology, our relationships, as I said before, all of those things are intertwined. And that footnote or that, that um, quote there under footnote number six, it says, like it or not, we live in a world dominated by social media. While many older forms of media continue to exist and to exert their influence, all have in some way had to bow before the ascendancy of new media. It's pervasive, it's ubiquitous, it's addictive, and it's changing everything. So it's pervasive, it's everywhere, everybody, people are getting addicted to these things, and it's it's literally changing the way we do everything. If you remember back when, you know, websites first came out, the idea of a website was just kind of like your storefront. It's kind of like a business card is how they pitched it, right? Like, you just want people to know that 
there's a business there. And now there's businesses that solely operate on a web basis that don't actually have a, a physical location. So we've gone from let's advertise to we're only doing business this way and, and bringing people in. And so it has changed a lot, even in a very short amount of time. Um, and the addictiveness, I, I actually find it quite fascinating that the addictiveness of social media, and when we say addictive, um, it, it's not that uh, this person has it in their DNA, right? You weren't born with this addiction. Um, you are, the because God has made us in such a way, and I think this really goes towards creation, that we are relational beings by creation, People are looking for ways to get that relationship, and they don't have it in person anymore, and so then they are drawn to social media because that's where they can actually talk to people and relate to people, but there's a bit of selfishness that goes on there. It's selfish because you're the one that gets to dictate everything. You dictate the conversation. You dictate what you want to what you want to post. You dictate what you want to read. You dictate what you want people to know about you. You dictate how long you're going to talk to them. And so your relationship, even though on social media, is still dictated on your terms. And so that's why studies have also shown. And there's a great parenting series that my wife's gone through with uh, Todd Murray and um, Jerry Rag. If you have, if you see kids long term on devices and then you take them off of that device, they are angry. Why are they angry? Because life just went from all about themselves to now they have to do something for somebody else. And so you're now digging into our nature. And so social media really panders to our nature because it's all about us. And we get to dictate all the terms. And you can see it come out whether you're a believer or not, right? Like you can see that come out in people. And so regardless, we need to guard ourselves against these things. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not a... I'm not anti all things online. I'm not a myself. I'm not active on various social media sites or whatever. You're not going to find me online posting my la latest, you know, uh, lunch that I ate. I'm sure not everybody would want to see oatmeal and beef jerky, right? It's not exactly the uh, it's not exactly the thing that's getting all the likes. It's good and it it gives me sustenance, but um, you know. And so I I think we just need to be careful. Um, and this isn't like you know standing up here saying throw your phones away and and get off of all media sites. Like with, with everything, you know your own tendencies. You're the one that can say, yeah, I can handle these things, or no, I can't, or am I putting too much time into this? Am I using it as a tool, essentially, or am I allowing this thing to control me? And that goes across the board with anything that we do. It could be from sports to social media to you know whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, and then you go to page four. So we'll start on the top of page four. And that, that quote there feels really good. It says, consequently, our encounters with others are becoming more and more limited and instrumental. So what that means is we're not actually interacting with people. And when we do interact with people, it's there just to get some sort of transaction done, instrumental. I'm meeting with you for a specific purpose to do A, B, and C. When that's done, I'm leaving. There's no small talk. There's no actual interaction. And he says, we associate rather than interrelate, interrelate, we hold ourselves back rather than open ourselves up, we pass on or steal by one another rather than pause and linger a while. The number of our close friends drops and the quality of our married life diminishes. And so this idea of associating with people, we holding ourselves back instead of opening ourselves up, we pass or steal by one another rather than pause and linger a while. And so the busyness of life comes in and we have to decide what is our, um, you could say, what is our priority list with what we're doing with our time. And then that, I, I really like this quote um, here. And uh, he says, our Western world has long emphasized knowledge, factual information, and proof over the process of being known by God and others. Like, do you understand what he's saying there? We're not interested in the long-term relationship of gaining something. We just want to know the fact. We just want to know, we, we don't want the, the thing that takes us to the fact. We just want the actual fact. And so we're really good at just finding that truth without getting everything else that it takes to get that truth, right? And then he says, uh, no wonder... 
then that despite all our technological advancements and the proliferation of social media, we are more intra and interpersonally isolated than ever. And so because we're only interested in knowing the fact and not actually the process of gaining that fact, we accumulate a lot of knowledge for ourselves, but that knowledge comes at a lack of relationship. And that you know, the next bullet point there is point should not be missed. We have a desire to know God and others. We also have a desire that others and God would know us, but we substitute real and meaningful relationships and think that we know people when in fact we only know the person they want us to know or that we think we know. And this is the this is what we miss out on when we are trying to get from thing to thing and we're so busy is that we miss out on that actual relationship with the people you know if you have kids uh, you understand that when from the birth of the child to the child leaving it may be 18 19 20 years which you know you sit back and say well it's a long time but when you think about it it goes by so quickly and as that time is going by so quickly, you know, we ask ourselves, what are we doing with that time? What are we cultivating during that time? And that's just not with families. That's, you know, if you're at a job or with friends or with neighbors or what are you, not what are you trying to get out of the relationship knowledge-wise, but are you knowing the people that you are around? And conversely, are they knowing who you are? And that next bullet point, we no longer seek out the relationship to get the knowledge we need. Since our end goal is just knowledge, we skip the relationship together. And we just get what we really want. And if you think about it, we only want to know people as much as we want them to know us. How many times have you thought, man, if people only knew this about me, oh, what would they think? The irony of that is everybody thinks that. <laughs> Because we are, we, we protect ourselves, and so instead of, hey, let me get to know this individual, we see somebody who has the knowledge that we need, so we get that knowledge, and then we go and we apply it in whatever way that we need to apply it. And so that next point there, we now and have been in an era where basic skills and knowledge are no longer passed down from person to person, but individually sought out. And not only are they individually sought out, but they're sought out on our own terms. I think one of the one of the things for me that was very eye-opening when uh, we lived overseas was how America is known as financial nomads, meaning that uh, the average American will travel to where the money is for a job or whatever that is, and leaving the family. And so when we were overseas, families had family homes that had been in, in their families for generations, family farms that were worked on for multiple generations, businesses that were owned for multiple generations, and they were all together. And the thought of like leaving and moving away wasn't even in their mindset. Why would I ever leave where my family is? But like, we're not like the Americans. We're not just chasing after money. Like, we're not moving over here because I got a job offer for $10,000 more a year, so I'm leaving my family and everything behind. I need, to, I need to go and chase that money. No, I'm building something here. So what, what happens is then you have skills and you have ideologies that then can be passed down from generation to generation, something we don't have anymore. And when was the last time you asked your mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, or whatever, how do I do this? Come here and show me how can I accomplish whatever this thing is. Versus I can go on YouTube and I can watch a 10-minute video on how to do that and I don't have to talk to anybody and then I get it done and I'm not wasting any time. I'm not saying that watching the YouTube video is bad. I've done it myself. But I've been, in my own life, I've tried to be more cognizant of getting, calling my dad over and asking him, yes, it's going to take more time. And if you're watching that, it takes more time. <laughs> but I get a chance and opportunity to sit down with him, and he walks me through whatever it is that I don't know how to do. That's building a relationship that's taking time and putting it into something instead of watching a man uh, on YouTube do the exact same thing thinking that's substituting somehow for a relationship. That's what we've drifted away from in our culture. And that's the next bullet point going to the days of families getting together for the sole purpose of teaching and learning skills and trades. 
I don't know, but I can only imagine how many skills and trades have been lost over the decades because, well, technology has taken over some of that and some of it is just lost, right, due, due to it being obsolete or no longer, no longer uh, wanting to be done. And since that next bullet point, since the basic relationship structure of the family is no longer valued as it once was, the idea of relationships in the outside world is also diminished. It is amazing to me that how the family goes, the culture goes, they mirror each other, we could argue either way, but you can see as relationships are diminished in one, they're also diminished in the other one as well. Why is that? Relationships take time to build. Sometimes it takes years to get to know someone. And some of this can be done via social media, absolutely. But to really know someone, there, there has to be actual personal contact. And I think this is why, this is my opinion, social media platforms have groups. I have no idea how many groups there are. I've never necessarily belonged to one. I did belong to one a long time ago uh, for smoking meat. I wanted to get some recipes on how to smoke meat. And those, those guys are old guys, and they've been smoking meat for a long time. And they had great recipes. Um, and uh, so I did. That's right. I had that. I just thought of that. Uh, but they're people with similar interests. They meet up, quote unquote, online. They discuss things they have in common. I find it interesting that social media saw a need for this. And so they're like, hey, people are isolated. How can we get them together? They're not actually doing it for the needs of the people. I hope you understand that. You know, those platforms are built, they make money on you. So advertisements come through there, the more that you're on there, they see the users, more advertisements come through, the longer that you're on there, they're making money. So they're not actually out for your best interest, right? The, as the saying goes, the house always wins. And so they're just there to generate more revenue. You might say, wow, they really love us. Look at that, we have a group for people who love, you know, hostas or whatever it is. And uh, it's just the greatest thing. They're not doing it because they love you. They're doing it because they want you to be there to make money. And that's what we live in, is a, a digital world, saturated culture. And all we have to do is make sure these things are not controlling us. They're, they're, not, they're not evil. These things are programmed, though. Remember that. There is a person with a sinful nature that programs these things. But technology in and of itself, it's not evil. Like a, a loaded gun is not evil, Right? How you use such things can be. And so it's the same thing with this, right? There are good tools that are out there that we're able to use, but we can't let them have control over us. And that, that last quote on the bottom, in our constantly connected world, many of us go to great lengths to avoid small talk. We deflect colleagues with earbuds, avoid talking on the phone like the plague, and opt for text when making arrangements with friends or coworkers. Previous studies have shown this might be making us less happy. But science recently added one more rationale to the case for a little more chit-chat in your life. Apparently, it can also make you smarter. <laughs> you know, if I, I listen to the, to the lingo of the kids today, you know, I sound like an old man when I say that, right? And uh, everything is shortened and they have abbreviations for things. And I was just talking to my kids last night about that. And I said, you know, that's actually causing you, I, I said, to have a lower IQ. Because you don't have to know a big word, right? You don't have to know a five-letter word anymore. You can substitute it, for, substitute it for a noise or some sort of two- or three-letter word. And then you don't actually know what it means, because sometimes when you hear them use such nouns as verbs, and they don't even know what that means, and you're thinking, you're, you're either going to be controlled by somebody who has more knowledge than you, uh, or you're, you're not going to be able to interact in the larger part of society. And so we tell our kids, you, you have to know, you have to have a vocabulary that you can interact with people in society. And your dad doesn't want to learn another language. <laughs> so... So I would say the digital age has many benefits. We've all benefited from it in some way. Obviously, things like in the medical field, there are massive technological advancements that we're all very thankful for. And so technology is not evil, right? And there are, you know, you can watch videos on the planet Earth, and you can see places that we've never been able to see before. I was just watching or looking at some pictures the other day from diving in Mexico and all the animals that are down in this uh, cavern. And I mean, all this stuff that we have nowadays, it's not, we're not looking at it like we're not saying this is a devil coming back or something like that. Don't, don't take me wrong. Um, but it can have the propensity to have control over us if we allow that. But that would be just like anything else. 
And uh, another bullet point there, it says this is because, so, you know, we, we're in a greater state of depression. I think we have a loss of cognitive abilities. And this is because we're no longer connected to people the way that God has designed us to be. You know, I, I often wonder why, you know, obviously I do a lot of biblical counseling, so I do a lot of research within the biblical counseling arena. And right now, like depression, anxiety, these things are, are just through the roof like they never have been before. And, and there's a lot of reasons why you could stand up here and, and articulate them. But one of them is this. We're not connected to people anymore. Right? So you, you look at the Bible, you read the Proverbs, and how many times does it talk about people being together and having a cheerful heart? You know, and the relationships that we have with one another. And I would just encourage you and implore you to don't 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 substitute, you know, a real relationship with, you know, I have friends online. They're not friends if you don't know who they are, right? You can't. You, they're just people you're associating with online or in a in a room with or a chat with or whatever those things are, right? Don't substitute that. And so, like all things, they should be used for God's glory, right? Like all things. Um, they should be used for personal edification. Technology is great. Doing studies, and, and I love the, you know, you can take a book online now, and, and uh, you can use AI to, to go through a book and find all of the things that I need out of that book instead of reading 600 pages, trying to figure out the different uh, words and sentences that you want. You can use it, and it gives you a list of everything that you need with the page numbers right there, and you're good to go. So you can use it for good things, right? It's not, it's not something that uh, is evil, but we just need to make sure that we're not letting it take over our own lives and our own relationships. So before we get into what the Bible says about time and relationship, any questions, comments about what we talked about before or now? Yeah, Andy. I think, I think Hmm. Well, I've got a, a Bible app, so that's my 30-second devotional. Yeah. Yeah, certainly something to be aware of. I would agree. Yeah, even you know, even like with that, you have the Bible app. Like it's great; it can send you a reminder every day. Hey, read your Bible, and so then you get reminded to sit down and read your Bible. Like, uh, but as as I would agree, you know, you just don't want that thirty second. Hey, I read a verse today, so uh, you know everything's really good. Um, but digging in and, and reading scripture, and, it, and you know, you also have to go to the other side and say, you know, we're not advocating. Hey, take five hours a day, wake up at midnight and read the first five hours of your day in Scripture, right? But it's, what do you need for yourself uh, to be able to be fed on the Word of God and to be able to live with His joy in, in light of what His Word says? So, yeah, I would absolutely agree. Use technology for your benefit. It's great stuff out there. Anybody else? Comments? Questions? Yeah. Um, well, then, in light of this, uh, what will your thoughts about like online dating um, I don't do online dating myself <laughs> um, uh, yeah you know and that's that's like online dating once again it's a tool that can be used and uh, I certainly would never stand up here and say no you know you should never do online dating um, but once again it's we don't want to substitute the relationship I would say online dating is more the platform to meet people so I would I would never say marry somebody that you met online and that you've never met before. Um, you know, you still want to have the... Th that's just, if you look at it as a tool for an initial point of contact, and then after that you're building the relationship in person. Um, I think that's, you know, in my own opinion, you know, that's that's fine. But like anything else, it, we don't want it to be used for evil um, and something that controls us. Um, but it is a tool that, that you can use. And I, I would also add, it probably falls into the gray area of your personal convictions. There's nothing in Scripture that says, hey, don't meet people via online, you know, websites or whatever. So, yeah. Um, in your point about um, um, passing on information with your family and stuff like that, and um, our culture now is a lot more bail out and get money and stuff like that as opposed to staying closer to where your family is and stuff like that. How do you, if you, if you do um, happen to be 
somewhere where your family, immediate family does live. Like if your family's in Texas and you live in Michigan? Exactly. Yeah. Well, what's the checks and balance with um, between that and the commandment to leave and cleave to your own family versus lingering close-knit with your own family? What's the, is there a healthy balance between sticking, like, the extreme, like you said in Africa, they're all together into one community that's the family they've always been together, mm -hmm. versus us literally hop in a few states over to start a new life? Yeah, first of all, I'd say it's all situational, right? So you would have to make that decision. But I would say to your question of leaving and cleaving, um, there is an idea like you have leaving spatially, so like um, where you are geographically in different areas, but then you also have leaving as in the headship of the household. So once that leaving and cleaving, you know, once that takes place, the the parents are no longer in control of the kids and so you look at it like spiritually but then as far as like leaving goes yeah there are great re the great um you know there are many reasons that come along that you would that you would go to a different place and i'm not talking down like hey you should never leave your home or whatever um but i think we the the point that i would make is we need to put more effort into thinking about the ramifications of leaving and why we're actually leaving. So the leaving in and of itself is not bad. And whether it's five states or, or two continents away, that's not a bad thing. Um, but the why is what I'm what I'm getting at behind it. Like if it's only for financial reasons, then I would say, what are you leaving behind? But God has also put in this, this thing of like exploring, right? And so man gets out and, and you want to go live somewhere else. And so you go and you live somewhere else. But I would also add to that, you still want to have that connection with the family for the the idea of like passing things down and helping along because you even see it in Titus 2, right? Like the older men are there, and obviously it's written to the church, right? But the older men are there to disciple the younger men, the older women are there to disciple the younger women. And so there's a pattern in the church. Well, the reason there's a pattern in the church is because there's a pattern in the family. And so as the family is passing these things down, then that's um, to be done in the church as well. So obviously those things are all situational and we live in, you know, 2024. And so it's not like it was before before I totally understand all of those things, my only exhortation would be to think about things more than just financially. Because a lot of times that's the thing that's driving the move is a financial move, which could be a good reason, once again. Like, it, it, it's not like just because it's for money, it's bad. Um, there could be no jobs where your family is, and so I can stay here and suffer, or I can move, you know, away and find a job and help support my family or something like that. So it is situational, but as, as I said, my only, my only hope is that it would be thought of more than just, I need to, because a lot of times when you're growing up and you just can't wait to get away from home, right? Because all that thing's not cultivated. And I was the same way. Um, but now as I look back, I think, I wish I would have spent some more time at home, maybe learning some of those things that I wouldn't have to go through the hardships I'm going through now that I could have, you know, because the, the old saying, you know, when you're, when you're 18, your, your dad knows nothing. And then when you're 21, you can't believe how much he, he learned in three years. Um, and, uh, you know, and so... Just, just that kind of idea. So it's a good question, and I, and I think it has to be, I think in our day and age it has to be taken um, with a little more context, but it's something I think we need to think about as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Thoughts? Yeah? Buy all those bottles and try them all with you. And yeah. like, she has a value of 
you know, helping your sister with her kids. And my sister was a fussy baby. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I would agree. And even you know, as as Todd's talking about, like leadership and elders at the church, and I've said this before, but you know, the elder team that we have, we have uh, guys that are older than me, and uh, it is it's like a safety net because as uh, as for me, you can have some ideas, and I'd see like Mike sitting here, and Mike can be like, Bob, we tried that thirty years ago. And it didn't work. So I'm like, that's fantastic. So we don't have to go through the whole process of trying to do it and failing when he can just say, hey, we tried that before and it didn't work. Or something along those lines with Dale and, and other guys who have been around and Chris that have that knowledge, that, as you know, Todd was saying, because it's a, a team. And so we may have great ideas, but the nice thing is there's enough guys there who have been around long enough to say, hey, yeah, that actually is a great idea. We've tried it in these three different ways and it didn't work. And so we can either spin our wheels again for the next six months trying it or we can move on to something else. And that's invaluable. Right, like those, so that way we're not just continually making the same mistakes over and over again, but that there's wisdom that's there, and so it's a, the same thing you're talking about. Like, you know, are we utilizing that that wisdom that that God's put around us, or uh, you know, with the with the advent, um, I once did a, a teaching on retirement, and uh, I, I found it rather fascinating. Right, you have um, shopping malls and golf courses and retirement centers uh, or retirement households and, you know, um, living communities. That's what I'm trying to think of. And these things came in because they had to figure out what to do with these older people. You had these young guys coming in, the Industrial Revolution was happening, and these other people were just getting in the way. How can we get rid of them? Because we want to make advancement. And so the world said, we're going to set these people aside. We're going to give them something to do for the last few years of their life. And so that way we can advance through these various industrial revolutions that came along. And so unfortunately, that's come into the church. And so into the church, you have both sides, right? You have the, the retired or the older generation that says, well, the younger generation doesn't look up to us, and so we're not going to help them. And you have the younger people like, oh, they don't get it. They don't understand, right? And so then they're not going to them. And so you have this kind of riff. And so you... And you look at the Titus II ministry. I'm actually writing a, a paper on this for my doctorate, the, the Titus II ministry, men and women in the local church and ministry-wise, and how the importance of it is. And, uh, and so I've, I found it fascinating over the years, the things that has happened in the church. Uh, and so we mimic what the culture does, and it's actually detrimental to our body because you don't have that wisdom that's coming down. Imagine a 70, 80-year-old person being able to tell a 25-year-old all the mistakes that they've made and the pitfalls that they've gone through, and you wouldn't have to go through all of those things. Now, granted, a 25-year-old, because we've all been there before, would still go through at least half of them just because they're bullheaded, but, but perhaps the half that they go through wouldn't be as bad. And so that's, that's the life of the church and the church body, and it's using the wisdom that God has given that God has given people. So, great comment. Any other comments, questions? It's good. Appreciate that, Chris. Just what we said here, too, is that, and I, I guess I'm seeing as I get older, <laughs> but when we raise your children, you know, we're used to them being around the house, communicating with them on a face-to-face -face basis constantly. Well, as they get out of the home and as they get older, uh, I think parents and grandparents do not appreciate finding out things by Facebook. <laughs> they would rather have a phone call or voice-to-voice -voice communication to maintain that relationship that, they're, good. that they're used to. So uh, for all the younger generation, you know, my dad, I'm saying that now is my, my dad appreciates the phone call rather because he doesn't do Facebook. I think all of us need to be cognizant of the face-to-face, -face, voice to voice is a much better alternative as long as the parents are alive. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, don't post your life updates online hoping that everyone sees them. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. All right, page five. What does the Bible have to say about time and relationship? There's a ton, by the way. So you could do a, a biblical theology of this going back from Genesis all the way through, so we're not going to do that. Um, I just grabbed a couple verses so we could kind of dive into them and see what it has to say and see what you guys think. Um, it says, well, the Bible does not speak to technology, 
you're not going to go in there and you're not going to read lamentations about how godless Facebook is or something like that. Um, and it does not give us direct commands about social media use. The Bible does give us plenty of principles and guidelines, things that we can apply to that kind of usage. Um, and this little quote here from, I think it was Ligonier, right? Yeah, uh, speaking in Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, and it says, more than a directive to improve time management, this is a divine command to live circumspectly. And once again, that word circumspectly we talked about last week. Circumspectly is an old English word for wisdom, but it actually is much, much better than wisdom. If you think about circumspectly, to, to bring into view 360 degrees around you. So you're making decisions based on all the information you can gather from around you, right? And so then you're making that choice. So you're trying to gain wisdom from all different streams before you, you make a choice. So it says to walk with God carefully, purposefully, and wisely. That means to live circumspectly. So Christians should never live passively, allowing the culture to shape and mold them into its image. Indeed, if we are not careful, the tools of digital technology that we have shaped will soon be shaping us. Social scientists have demonstrated that this is already happening in our culture. Indeed, millions are addicted to their screens because of social media, video games, news, sports, entertainment. Dear Christian, this will happen to you if you let the flood of new digital technology roll over you without any serious reflection about how best to harness it for good. Therefore, take some time to evaluate your use of digital technology and may your most solid and growing connection be to Christ. And that's a really good article, I, uh, footnote 12 there, um, if you guys want to look at that. He's got some other stuff too on there about it. But you see what he's saying there, and I, I like the second sentence, Christians should never live passively, allowing the culture to shape and mold them into its image. And so living passively is just like, hey, whatever's coming at me is coming at me. If if this is what I'm supposed to do, then I'm just going to do it. You know, and to, to Chris's point, oh, everybody puts their, you know, uh, baby announcements on Facebook, so I'm just going to do that too. Um, you know, and if you're just living that way, you're not actually thinking through. So circumspectly is is uh, is action. It's saying I'm going to think through what ramifications my decisions have. Now, to be sure, we're not uh, omniscient. We don't know everything that's going to happen, right? And that's not what God is calling us to do. But to the best of our ability, before we make a decision, uh, we should be looking at that. And think about how much time you put into relatively, um, uh, you know, inconsequential decisions. Think about your the shampoo you use for your hair. How many times have you looked at the ingredients or... Um, what it actually does for you, right? Think about the food that you're eating, how much time and effort you put into that. Think about the vehicle that you drive. Think about all those things that we put so much thought into, and now take that and put it into your spiritual life as well. How is this going to affect my relationship before God, and how is it going to affect my relationship with people, right? And before we, we make that choice. Once again, we'll never have all the information because we're not God, but we're accountable for the information that we can get. And then that verse, the two verses there, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, he says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Uh, so as opposed to a modern obsession with gaining knowledge, the Bible talks about gaining wisdom, but not just the accumulation of wisdom, but for the purpose of putting that wisdom into practice for our daily life. So you could look at kind of the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing something. Wisdom is actually applying it in a useful way, right? And uh, so the why, that's why it says uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can know God and you can know that God's up there, but the wise man is the one who actually fears God and he's putting that, that knowledge into practice. Now I have a reverence and awe, a fear of God, and now I'm living in such a way that reflects that. And it says, this is further explained upon or expounded upon when the Bible talks about relationships, both in the family, the church, and the community at large. We are also to show that we have wisdom by making the most of our time. If you look at that verse there, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, to get a, a little nerdy on you, that word making there is a participle, right? So a participle would support a main verb. So I, I, I like this because it really shows what Paul's trying to say. Well, then what is he saying? Therefore, be careful how you walk. So there's your exhortation, your imperative. Be careful how you walk. Well, how is it that we are to be wise and not wise? So not as wise, but unwise. So he's saying, be careful how you walk. 
You want to be wise and not unwise. So how does the wise man walk? He is the one who, here's our participle, making the most of your time. So the wise man walks carefully because he's making the most of his time. Well, what's his motivation? You have your, we would say, causal phrase there, right? Because the days are evil. So the wise man knows the days are evil. He wants to make the most of them so that he can be careful how he walks. And so how that's what we want to look at. Then if you look at page 6, is how we use the time we have been allotted is going to show if we're wise or unwise. And just at the the onset, right, this isn't saying that you any moment you're not spent reading your Bible or in prayer is a waste of time. God has given us all things to enjoy, and so we are to enjoy God's creation. He's given us good things to have, and so we shouldn't think like you're only spiritual or you're only actually using your time wisely if you're sharing the gospel, reading your Bible, praying in church, or singing. Otherwise, everything else is off the table. It's not true at all. Um, even John Calvin used to go sailing in the lake on Sundays sometimes, but don't tell anybody. Um, and so we are to we are to enjoy God's creation, and we're to enjoy the things that God has given us. By enjoying such things, it is using your time wisely, because perhaps it's for refreshment, or even getting to know people in relationship-wise. But he says, why does Paul there exhort them to be careful? Well, it's because the days are evil. And so how do we put this all together uh, in what we talked about? I would say, what is a, what's a holistic view of, of how we use our time? And this um, quote here, I thought, put it together really well. It says, even without the kind of persecution or opposition known by the Christians of Paul's day, the world we live in is not conducive to using time wisely, especially for purposes of spirituality and godliness. In fact, our days... Uh, are days of active evil. There are great thieves of time that are millions of the world, the flesh, and the devil. They may range from the high-tech, socially acceptable preoccupations to simple, idle talk, or ungoverned thoughts. But the natural course of our minds, our bodies, our world, and our days lead us towards evil, not towards Christ-likeness. You could kind of sum that up by saying you can't expect to grow in Christ's likeness by doing nothing. This culture is like a river, and it will take you to wherever it wants you to go. And so we need to make sure that we are not allowing that to happen. And the thing in this quote that really got to me, when you think of wasting time, look at what he says there, our ungoverned thoughts. And that's very convicting. How many times do we think things that are not pure, lovely, good repute, right? How many times are we thinking about ourselves too much? How many times are we thinking about things that we wish would happen or we wish did happen in the past? All of that is just wasting time. Because you can't change anything in the past, and nobody in here knows the future, so that's a waste of time. Right? We're preparing for the future and those kind of things, of course. Right? But what are what is our mind, what's cultivating in our mind. We want to make sure we're not wasting our time with ungoverned thoughts, meaning the things that we allow in there, we have to allow in there. We can't just allow them to come in there on their own. And he goes on to say in the next quote uh, from the same article, he says, finally our days are, are of active evil because every temptation and evil force are active in them. The use of time is important because time is the stuff of which days are made of. If we do not discipline our use of time for the purpose of godliness in these evil days, these evil days will keep us from becoming godly. You know, one of the the hardest things for me, these last two weeks, we had day camp that's here. I love being outdoors, right? And I love interacting with the people. I know a lot of the kids, and I know the people doing the crafts, and of course, Andy's standing out front, and I just want to go out and hang out with them. i got a lot of work to do. So I let the work stack up on my desk, I make really good excuses, and I leave and I go out to interact with people, right? And so even that, which is a good thing, but it still has to be governed with the fact that you have work that needs to be done. Uh, and so that pull is like, I'd rather, I'd rather be outside on the riflery range. I'd rather go start fires and eat with you guys, which is why I show up there every day to get food that you cook over the fire, right? Just to check up on you, make sure things are going okay. <laughs> right? And so... I like to do that. I like being out. I like interacting with the people. I love seeing the crafts that are going on. But 
there's still stuff that needs to be done. So you can make the excuse like, oh, you know, you heard Todd's sermon. I need to smell like the sheep. I'm not going to do any work for these next two weeks. I'm going to go out and smell like the sheep, right? Or a campfire, right? But that's just giving in to, to my own selfish desires because while that's good and should be done in my opinion, there's other things that also need to be done too. And so we, we can't, uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're thinking about, hey, how am I going to get stuff done? Because there are things that need to be done. But there are, there are things that we shouldn't use as an excuse in order not to do the other things that we know absolutely need to be done. So any questions or comments on the Ephesians verse before we jump into to Colossians? So I heard for six days. Yeah. Right. I agree. That's really good. I agree. So, yes, ma'am. So knowing the, what, what do I need to get done? Yeah, that would be for you. What do you need to get done? Yes. That then that and then you would set your your time in that way, and making sure that the things that need to get done are getting done, uh, and then the things that you you want to get done. Hopefully some of the needs and the wants are the same. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes you just got to do what you have to do. Um, but yeah, then set your, your schedule accordingly, right? Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> I agree. That, that, yeah, and that's where like dis, uh, discernment, wisdom comes in. You know, sometimes we have um, timelines of things need to be get done. We have deadlines of stuff that has to be done. And so some of that stuff has to take priority. And like we said last week, every decision to do something is an active decision not to do something else. And so there are things that suffer, if you will, but there are other things that just need need to be done, right? So that's where we just have to decide. We have to make that triage list, if you will, of things, So, which can be hard. Anybody else? Look like you have something to say. Nothing? Yeah? Mrs. Jensen? Nothing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, Colossians, uh, Colossians 4 5, you see in the middle of the page. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of opportunity. Uh, the ESV has that last uh, clause, making the most of, op- of the opportunity to be making the best use of time. So just depending on how you want to. Um, you know, translate that, the same ideas coming out. And I do find it fascinating. Ephesians talks a bit more generally. Uh, well, Paul wrote to the Colossians here. He's actually giving more specifically that he were to act toward outsiders, or in other words, towards unbelievers in such a way. So in the context, Paul's talking actually about our speech and how we interact with people. So part of stewarding our time and stewarding how do we make the most of the opportunity is then how we talk. Um, and uh, it can either be a blessing or a hindrance to those who are listening. And uh, how do we make the most, you can see that bullet point there, how do we make the most of every opportunity? He tells us in verse 6, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. And so if you think about this on a practical level, right? So Paul's telling the church here, and so how do we how do we take this, this teaching of Paul and bring it to our bring it to our daily use. You, know, you can just ask yourself the general question, how do you interact with people on a daily basis? How do you speak to people on a daily basis? Now I'm going from you know, the person, if you, if you go to the grocery store and it's not an automatic you know, thing, whatever it is, but you have somebody actually scans it for you and they check you out, how do you talk to that person? When something breaks and you call in, how do you talk to that person? Or how do you talk to individuals throughout the course of your natural day, how are you interacting with them? Is it seasoned with grace, making use of the opportunity that God's given you? Uh, or is it speaking in, in harsh terms? Uh, and so 
you know, that's what Paul's talking about here, living towards those who are outside. You know, if, if you, you know, when we come to church, most people are, you know, you're in a safe zone, if you will. I don't like using that term anymore, um, but uh, you're in a safe space here at church. And uh, and so you're you're more apt not to have your guard up. You, you're you more apt to not be as easily offended, though probably still offended. Um, but when you go out into the, the real world, obviously that's a different story when you go out and interacting with unbelievers. And so it can be harder. And so that's why Paul's saying here, let the things that we're saying, we're responding with grace uh, to people. So not just how we walk in the life that we live, but also the words that are coming out of our mouth. Um, and so at the top of page 7, this just came by, just found a website there. I don't know anything about it, but I was just using time wisely. I grabbed some of the things. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, how do we, and I put in italics, accidentally waste our time. Um, and, I, and I think these four things that I was reading through are very helpful. You know, we waste time through procrastination. You know, when there's something to be done, stalling just wastes time, right? And uh, we all we all can be guilty of this from time to time. Um, you know, for example, you don't need to check off all check all your social media accounts before you begin a task on your computer. You know, we have these things that pop up, notifications, right? When a notification comes up and you see that and now you're tempted to go, oh, I just got that email. I just want to look at that email. I just want to look at that message or whatever that thing is. And so now instead of doing the task that you sat down or set out to do, now you've gotten over here on this side. And so we want to make sure that it's not a, a habit um, going forward. But procrastination, you know, and that... Procrastination can come under a lot of good godly headings, right? We can make really good excuses and actually sound super biblical as to why we're not doing the thing that we're supposed to be doing. But at the end of the day, we just need to say, hey, if it, if it needs to get done and, uh, and I'm able to do it, then I, I should take care of that thing, whatever that is. Um, and I stand up here saying this as a guy who has many things that need to be done at her house. I'm not making eye contact with my wife right now um, because I don't want her to say, do you remember what you said 10 minutes ago? Um, and then that leads to the next one. We waste time through perfectionism. Perfectionism is a myth. It's an excuse for pride. I'll just throw it out there. You cannot be perfect. So when you say, oh, I'm a perfectionist, no, you're prideful in thinking that you're God because the only person that's perfect is God. So to say you don't want to do something because you're afraid you're not going to be perfect, you're saying, I'm afraid my godly attributes are not going to come out. And so since I can't show to you how godly I am, I'm not going to do it. And boy, it sounds pious. But really, it's just an excuse for not to do it. You have such a high opinion of yourself that you're saying, oh, I would do that, but I'm afraid of making a mistake. Imagine if all the things you did, you didn't do because you made a mistake. You would never do anything. You're going to make mistakes. That's not the question. Right? And I, and I like the phrase he says there. It's kind of hard for me to swallow, but I did like it. Often good enough will get the job done. Good enough does not mean it's not for the glory of God. We're going to do things for the glory of God. Period. That's what the Bible says. Do all things for the glory of God. But God does not expect all things to be done perfect because he's the only one that's perfect. We should use our talents. We should use the education that we get. We should use all of those things to the best of our ability, realizing that we are never going to be perfect, but God just expects us to do what we can do with the tools that he's given us. So don't use that term, I'm just a perfectionist. Because all you're, you're shouting to the world is, I'm super prideful and I just want you to know, but I'm putting it under the guise of perfectionism. You waste time by overanalyzing. You know the old term analysis to paralysis? Spending excessive amounts of time deliberating over inconsequential decisions. Oh, I love that. That one's not my problem. I'm the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> like, oh, it sounds good. Let's do it. You know, overanalyzing. If, if you struggle with this, if you struggle with, oh, but when you just go down your, your, your flow chart, and you're 10 years into your flow chart without making a decision yet, ask somebody for help, right? Don't overanalyze things. Analyze them for sure, but there has to come a time where the trigger's pulled, right? And then the last one, waste time by overindulging. It's not wrong to spend time shopping, watching TV, social media, all those kind of things, but we don't want those things to become part of our daily routine where all of a sudden we're building in this this kind of time where we can indulge ourselves in these areas. 
And it just goes back to the idea of not letting these tools or this entertainment have control over us, but we're controlling how much time is being used. Any questions on those four? Are we accidentally waste time? Yeah, Ed. Yeah. And I always have to remind you, you know, the place has a PA system. <laughs> or you can come and see me in person if it's urgent. Yeah. And uh, they, they always seem to be so tight as email, you know, they expect me to answer. And I wouldn't answer if I was at the desk. How do you handle those kind of people that always put those demands in? Yeah, with grace. And, um, you know, it. It may be the expectation is not going to change on their half because you're probably not going to change their view. You may have to adapt somehow, um, or you have to manage the expectation on their part to where you tell them, yeah, I understand that you send out an email, um, but I'm not checking my email every three or four minutes. I don't take my, like, I don't take my phone with me. I usually leave it in my office, and uh, I don't want to be tethered to it. I have no interest in that. When I get back, I've got enough things on that device that could have taken up all my time as I was every once in a while I forget and I bring it back with me and I regret it but um, you know I just leave it in my office and so it's the same way but if you manage other people's expectations I find that while they may not like it um, they can understand so I would start there and then you know secondly just being being honest like I don't I'm not someone who's tied to this so it may take me a little bit longer to get back but anything that you do would have to be under grace right showing them grace and realizing that you know, that they're, they're, they have an expectation and, and you'll do your best. But it's unfortunate that's the day we live in and that's kind of the, the umbrella, right? So um, I'm sure we all could, could, uh, could uh, benefit from, from having coworkers that don't have that, but unfortunately. I mean, not me. My coworkers are fantastic. But <laughs> just for the record, uh, anyway. That's a good question. Then. Anybody else on those four things before we hit the last one? <clears throat> So what about relationships? Putting this all together, time, technology, relations, we've been talking about this a little bit here and there, um, but I wanted to hit on a few scriptures, and once again, you know, whatever 30 plus one and other scriptures are in, in the Bible, um, but oftentimes when we discuss being a good steward, having relationships with others is uh, nearly never on the list of topics. It was actually the, the least talked about one as I was researching it. Um, and there's certainly some things out there about it, but as far as like being a good steward of your relationship with one another isn't something that is readily written on. If you were to Google like time or money, I mean, you'd get lists for days uh, on what that looks like. And so uh, I think this has been neglected a bit. Um, but you see there as Christians, our relationships with others must be predicated upon love. So many verses speak to the love of one another. If you think about John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So that, that's our relationship foundation is on love, right? And so showing preference to the other people, um, you know, weeping with people, mourning with people, rejoicing with people, you know, going out of our way for people, looking out for the needs of other people, all of these ways, this is how we build relationships when it's predicated and built upon love. You look at 1 Thessalonians 3.12, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound for love for one another. So I get this question sometimes, I just can't love that person. And I say, you're right. But look at what Paul told them. The Lord caused you to increase. Are you praying that the Lord would cause you to increase in your love for that individual or those people or whatever that is? Right? And so, then he says, for one another, and look at the next uh, clause, and for all people. So not only are we to increase in love for our brothers and sisters in the church and in the, the, the body of Christ, but we're to have a love for all people. And that love for all people is the same love that it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Our love for the world is that we can give them the gospel message. The same message, message that saved us. And we do show them kindness, right? The kindness of the Lord brings us to repentance. And so we show them acts of kindness. And we show them tangible ways of love. But we don't do it in a vacuum. We do it under the idea of we want to share the gospel with people. I think like Connor, you said you handed out water at the, the festival, right? 
Like that's an act of kindness. We're not just here to to give you, you know, the gospel message, but to actually tangibly give you something that you need on this hot day as well, right? When you see Romans 13, 8, Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. In all the different ways the Bible talks about how we can show love to one another, Sometimes it's just through being with somebody, in proximity with them, talking with them. Sometimes it's financially. Sometimes it's a gift of some item that they need. Sometimes it's a car ride. You know, sometimes it's a phone call. I know after all of this, not a phone call face-to-face, right? (laughs) All of those things, you know, can be acts of love. And we know that the idea, concept, definition of love can be very subjective and tainted. And so we want to say, what is true biblical love towards one another? You know, just those few examples, how can you show that toward your fellow brothers and sisters as you're sitting here? And once again, this is just a couple. Forgiveness, compassion, humility, patience, bearing with one another, showing each other honor, and there's a whole lot more. These are just ways that we can do that with one another. And I just wanted to end with this, Hebrews 10, 24. And it says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And this word consider here can mean like to observe, to be attentive, to discover, to perceive. And all of these words are relational words. So the writer of Hebrews is saying you need to get to know one another, not just for the purpose of saying you know somebody, but very, very specifically so that you can stimulate each other to love and good deeds. So what does that look like practically? Right? You see somebody in the church, you get to know somebody in the church, you realize, man, they really have a gift of X. Pick your gift, whatever that is. And you get to now say, hey, have you ever thought about serving in the church in this way? And they're like, no, actually, I didn't know that you could do that in the church. You know, especially when it comes to, like, administrative stuff. I realize a lot of people don't realize the administrative work that goes in and the giftingness that they have and the lack of that giftingness that many of us have and how we need the administrative side. And so you now can stimulate them to good works. Like, hey, have you thought about using your gifts in this way? And stimulate them to love. Hey, you know, I I know that you're having a... Uh, uh, an issue with another believer. Can you overlook that for the sake of unity and love? Or can I stimulate you to love by going and talking to that individual with you and helping you through this, this problem that you're having? But we can't do that with people if we don't know who they are. So all of this stuff comes together. How does it all come together? The time you put into relationships has to be actual real relationships, not just through technology. You don't know somebody because your friend's on, online with them. But it takes time to get to know them. We prioritize our time. Yes, we all have busy lifestyles, and we need to make sure that we're getting things done. We're not saying neglecting taking care of your household or taking care of families or anything like that. But as we look at this holistically, that time that we need to make sure we're stewarding well has to be put into things that God has ordained for that. We're taking care of ourselves. We're taking care of the people who are around us and doing that for the glory of God. So before we close, questions or comments in the last couple sections? Jason. Never get it perfect. Like somebody can be off channel, maybe you're not communicating well, maybe you're not. So it's just really, really nice. It is. You just kind of expect that. And I really like with the message this morning overlaying the idea, especially for husband's father, the idea of the shepherd. You know, the shepherd has right tone to just cover that communication, whatever, you know, 
he was charged in each battle. It's just a really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, one other thought was that mistakes are absolute. You know, we always want to avoid mistakes. Mistakes are good because if you actually learn from that mistake, that becomes a Right. And that wisdom begins to compound on itself. And as you're older, you know how to sidestep it. So you just Google it. You got the little bit of information. That's right. You didn't, you didn't even gain the knowledge. You just grabbed a little bowl of information. Mm -hmm. You gained no knowledge. That's right. So the process is actually, I don't know, same thing as I get older. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, I would agree 100%. We're skipping the process for the for the results, but yet we miss everything in the in the meantime. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. What can we do to encourage other people to have a face to face? You know, they're so into the on the uh, social media that they're avoiding contact with another person. I mean, they'll sit in a group, across the in the chairs, and again, or on their phones, talking to somebody else, or maybe even human person across the room. Yeah. How do we encourage them? Do the face -to -face. Yeah, my favorite thing is to make him feel awkward and just go sit next to him and talk to him. <laughs> so it, it doesn't bother me at all. Like I, I see that and I'll just go and and talk to him and so and encouraging them just like that. So yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't I don't have a, a methodology right to, of how to do that except for you just got to go and do it. Because it's, once again, if you're just going to wait for that to happen, it won't happen. So as the older person, you're the one that's going and initiating that. And it may take two, three, four, or five times. And like Jason said, which I think is so key, communication is never perfect. And so oftentimes we get offended um, by things that were miscommunicated, not realizing that we too miscommunicate. And so even taking that idea, when you're going to communicate with, with younger people, um, and just realizing that it's not, it may not be the first or second try, but you have to continually just do that and, and let them see the benefit of it as well, of a face-to-face too. So, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Ed, and I think, um, you know, the, the, as the older generation, feels more left out in the younger generation, you know, thinks they know more and more, which, by the way, is not different than the history of the world, right? It's always been like that. And so we shouldn't say, wow, this new generation, you were the exact same way when you were that age too, so you shouldn't be shocked. And, um, I mean, I wasn't, but I'm sure you guys were. And uh, so as you're reaching out to them, just, you know, have love as the key and, and the desire to help them grow. So that's good, Ed. All right, guys, so next week there's no class. Because uh, the 4th of July or 7th of July, we're celebrating the 7th of July. And uh, and then the last one we'll do will be on money and resources and all that. So let me pray for us, and then we'll be gone for the day. So Lord, we thank you for uh, just your wisdom. We thank you, Lord, that we can read your word and just talk about things. And Lord, we're uh, so grateful for the time you have given us. I pray, Lord, that each of us would desire to use the time wisely. And uh, Lord, for your honor and for your glory, for the edification of the church, Lord. And I do pray, Lord, that we would each be able to just enjoy the things that you've given us, uh, Lord. So we pray you bless our time in Christ's name. Amen. All right, guys. Hope you're staying for fellowship. We'll see you later. <clears throat>